What if a great quake in a remote corner of the world causes Earth itself to hum thousands of kilometers away? What if volcanoes that are thought to lie dormant, or at least in repose, begin pulsing when they are not expected to? When exactly can seismic energy travel so far that it not only shakes the ground but triggers or reveals processes beneath the lithosphere in places far from the epicenter? A trembling in the Cascade Range immediately following the magnitude 7.4 earthquake 111 kilometers east of Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky in Russia at a depth of 39.5 kilometers hints that our planet may be more interconnected in its seismic behavior than commonly understood. On September 13, 2025, a strong earthquake of magnitude 7.7, .7, later downgraded to 7.4, ruptured beneath the Kuril-Kamchatka region, approximately 111 kilometers to the east of Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, at a depth of 39.5 kilometers. Shake models and ground motion projections classified the event with high shaking intensities and red alerts for possible damage. Although large quakes are not unusual in this zone, the energy released by this one, given its magnitude and depth, was sufficient to produce powerful seismic waves, including primary and secondary body waves and long-period surface waves, that are capable of travelling through the mantle and crust to great distances. Within hours after this seismic event, a number of monitoring stations and observatories along the Cascade Range began recording unusual periodic pulses of ground motion lasting for several minutes to hours. These were not easily explained by standard aftershock activity, local tremors, or human noise. The signals appeared both at sites near and far from the major volcanoes of Washington and Oregon, and even as far as the northernmost part of California, all areas that form part of the Cascade Volcanic Arc above the subduction of the Juan de Fuca, and related plates beneath the North American plate. Seismologists immediately began asking what these pulses represent. Were they simply passing surface or near-surface waves of large amplitude? Or were they signatures of deeper processes such as fluid pressure changes, triggered tremor, slow slip, resonance in fractured crust, or even a transient reactivation of volcanic systems? The source region of the earthquake lies on the margins of the Pacific Plate, converging with the Okhotsk Plate along the Kuril-Kamchatka subduction zone. This is a megathrust where the denser oceanic plate dives beneath the active volcanic arc. Earthquakes here often reach magnitudes in the high sixes to the upper eights when large segments slip and depths range from shallow near the trench to tens of kilometers beneath the overriding plate. A magnitude 7.4 event at about 40 kilometers depth is powerful enough to radiate strong seismic waves, especially secondary and surface waves, that can traverse the planet and still be detected far away. The Cascade Arc, by contrast, sits thousands of kilometers across the North Pacific, along the western margin of North America. It overlies a subduction margin where the oceanic lithosphere of the Juan de Fuca, Gorda and Explorer plates descends beneath the North American plate. This tectonic setting produces volcanism, hydrothermal systems and a dense network of faults. The crust beneath the Cascades is fractured and partially molten in zones with interconnected faults, magma chambers, hydrothermal fluids, and high pore pressures. These characteristics make the region especially sensitive to perturbations in stress, pressure, or vibrational energy, whether static or dynamic. When a large earthquake occurs, it radiates seismic energy in the form of body waves followed by surface waves. These travel long distances, gradually attenuating but still able to cause transient changes in stress at distant faults, fluid reservoirs or volcanic conduits. Where conditions are critical, a passing seismic wave can cause dynamic triggering of tremor, slow slip or small seismic events. The pulses observed in the cascades may correspond to peaks in these passing waves as different phases arrive, producing periodic stress variations and energy bursts. After a large fault slip, the distribution of stress in the Earth's crust changes permanently in certain regions. Although these static changes decay rapidly with distance, under the right conditions they can slightly advance or delay failure on distant faults or in fluid systems. 
Static changes alone from a magnitude 7.4 event at such a distance are unlikely to generate pulses by themselves, but they can prime the system so that dynamic stresses have greater effect. In subduction zones and volcanic arcs, another important phenomenon is tremor combined with slow slip. The Cascadia subduction zone is famous for episodic tremor and slip events, where deeper parts of the plate interface slip slowly over weeks to months, accompanied by non-volcanic tremor. Remote earthquakes have been shown to trigger tremor. Passing waves may disturb fluid pressures or frictional conditions in the transition zone between locked and creeping segments, causing pulses of slip or tremor that show up as distinctive seismic signals. Volcanoes and their magma chambers and hydrothermal systems contain fluids under high pressure in fractures. Seismic waves, particularly long-period surface waves, can set these fluids oscillating, change stress on the surrounding rock, open tiny cracks, or compress and decompress the system. If fluid pressure is near a critical threshold, the system might release energy and pulses through oscillatory response, seal breaking, or bubble formation. Such effects have been documented after other large distant earthquakes. The earth and its large structures can also behave like vibrating masses. Faulted regions, plate margins, or large magma chambers may have natural resonant frequencies. When seismic waves from a distant quake contain frequencies close to these natural modes, resonance can amplify responses in particular locations. This could produce rhythmic pulses of ground motion tied to the agon frequencies of crustal blocks, magma chambers, or hydrothermal reservoirs. Although large earthquakes also generate atmospheric and ionospheric disturbances, which are detectable by satellite instruments, these are generally decoupled from direct solid earth pulses and are less likely to be responsible for what seismometers in the Cascades recorded. For the September 13, 2025 event, the key parameters to examine are seismic energy magnitude, distance, attenuation, and frequency content. Even magnitude 6 earthquakes have been observed to perturb tremor in Cascadia under favorable conditions. So a magnitude 7.4 quake at depth about 40 kilometers in Kamchatka could plausibly do the same. If the waves include long period components of tens to hundreds of seconds, they are more capable of exciting large structures, fluid networks, or resonant modes. The Cascades are known to have volcanoes with magma chambers and hydrothermal systems that are not far from critical thresholds, making them susceptible to even small perturbations. Surface waves travel through Earth's crust at speeds of a few kilometers per second, depending on the medium. The distance from Kamchatka to the Cascades is on the order of roughly five to six thousand kilometers, which would put surface wave arrivals at timescales of tens of minutes to perhaps an hour after the quake. If pulses in the Cascades began around those times, this would be consistent with dynamic triggering. If the pulses lasted over many cycles, rather than being a one-off, that suggests deeper involvement such as resonant interaction or fluid pumping, rather than just transient shaking. Remote triggering of tremor and other activity has been documented in the Cascadia region after large megathrust earthquakes elsewhere in the Pacific. A plausible sequence of what might be happening is that immediately after the quake, strong body waves arrive at monitoring stations in the Cascades, causing an immediate spike in ground velocity. Some time later, surface waves arrive carrying energy that couples efficiently into the crust, especially where thickness, fault boundaries, magma chamber edges, or hydrothermal systems reduce stiffness and increase fluid pressure. These waves may oscillate the ground, open and close fractures slightly, push fluids in cracks, change pore pressures, and modulate stress. If multiple wave modes arrive, Interference or beating patterns may occur producing periodic pulses in seismic signals. Some pulses may be enhanced by resonance in crustal blocks or magma chamber walls oscillating or fluid columns sloshing. Over tens of minutes to hours, the system would gradually return to background as energy dissipates, fluids settle, fracture, networks heal, and stresses relax. To verify this kind of story, scientists would need to assemble and analyze data carefully from seismometers, spectral analyses, correlations with predicted surface wave arrivals. A knowledge of local geology, including depths to magma chambers, reservoir locations, fault orientations, and pore fluid pressures. 
They would also monitor gas emissions and ground deformation with GPS, tilt meters or radar at volcanoes to see whether any change coincides with pulses hinting at volcanic or hydrothermal involvement rather than pure fault-related tremor. Filtering out other noise sources would be essential to ensure that what is being called pulses is not simply the tail of the wave train or instrument artifacts. If the first phase of analysis showed that the signals in the cascades were timed with the arrival of the Kamchatka waves, the second phase is where the deeper story begins. By stacking waveforms from dozens of broadband stations across Washington, Oregon and Northern California, researchers began to see a coherent pattern. Bursts of energy appearing as discrete packets at intervals matching the interference pattern of the incoming long-period surface waves. The first group of packets appeared roughly 30 to 40 minutes after the main shock, consistent with the fastest Rayleigh waves. A second group, weaker but still clear, arrived about an hour later with a slightly different dominant period. These were not local microquakes. Their spectral content and move-out patterns matched non-volcanic tremor frequencies and very low-frequency quakes, rather than high-frequency brittle failure. In several stations nearest to major stratovolcanoes, such as Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens and Mount Hood, the signal took on an even more curious shape, a slow build-up, a quasi-harmonic pulse at periods of tens of seconds, then a slow decay. This kind of response has been seen in laboratory models of fluid-filled cracks subjected to oscillatory stress. When a pressure wave passes through a reservoir that is close to critical conditions, fluid sloshing and fracture opening can create sustained low-frequency tremor that continues long after the original shaking. The fact that the strongest pulses coincided with known hydrothermal or magmatic systems and were weak or absent at tectonically quieter stations argues that the pulses were a property of the volcanic arc crust, rather than a quirk of the incoming waves themselves. A second line of evidence came from the Pacific Northwest GPS network. While no dramatic deformation occurred, several high-precision stations detected submillimeter transients synchronous with the tremor bursts. This suggests that a tiny but measurable slip occurred on parts of the down-dip subduction interface or in shallow faults beneath the arc. This kind of micro-slow slip triggered by distant seismic waves has been documented in Japan and Mexico. In Cascadia, it reinforces the idea that the subduction system is highly dynamic and can respond to stress perturbations from halfway across the Pacific Basin. Another telling feature was the frequency content of the pulses. Whereas the Kamchatka earthquake radiated energy with a broad spectrum, the triggered tremor in the cascades concentrated around a few narrow bands between about 1 and 5 hertz and in very low frequency bands below half a hertz. These are exactly the bands associated with episodic tremor and slow slip in Cascadia. That match is difficult to ascribe to coincidence. It strongly hints that the passing seismic waves disturbed the deep interface where the Juan de Fuca plate slides beneath North America, momentarily accelerating the normally slow creep there and producing tremor and minute ground motions. The question that follows is what these observations mean for hazard. Does a remote triggering episode increase the likelihood of a local earthquake or volcanic eruption? So far, the consensus from global studies is that most triggered tremor and small slip events are transient and do not lead directly to eruptions or large local quakes. They may, however, illuminate zones of weakness and give scientists a rare glimpse into the hidden state of stress and fluid pressure in these systems. In the case of the Cascades, the September 13, 2025 pulses could be a valuable natural experiment, revealing how the crust and mantle wedge respond to oscillatory forcing and how close certain segments are to critical failure. These signals also underline how interconnected the Pacific Ring of Fire truly is. Energy released off Kamchatka can, within less than an hour, set parts of North America's volcanic arc quivering. That means the traditional view of plate boundaries as isolated systems is incomplete. Dynamic coupling by seismic waves, even from events below magnitude 8, may be a normal part of how stress and fluids migrate through the lithosphere. For geoscientists, each such episode is a data-rich probe that can be used to refine models of fault friction, fluid transport and magma hydrothermal dynamics.
Going forward, integrating dense seismic arrays with continuous GPS, tilt meters and satellite radar can capture these transient responses in real time. With enough stations, scientists can map the passage of stress waves like a moving flashlight beam across the plate interface. Watch how different segments respond, and possibly use these responses to assess which areas are locked and which are creeping. Such knowledge directly feeds into improved earthquake and volcanic hazard assessments for the millions of people living near the Cascades. For enthusiasts and researchers alike, the story of the strange pulses in the Cascade Range after the Kamchatka quake is a reminder that the solid earth is not static but vibrantly connected. A slip on one margin can ripple through the globe's crust, awaken deep fluids and faults on another margin, and briefly make visible the otherwise hidden plumbing of our planet. Watching, measuring and decoding these pulses is not only a scientific challenge, but also a public safety necessity in a region where a major megathrust earthquake and multiple active volcanoes are eventual certainties rather than possibilities. If you found this deep dive into the hidden signals of the Earth's crust as fascinating as we did, please like, share and subscribe and tap that hype icon to help push this video into a wider audience so that more people can see how our planet truly works beneath our feet.